All right, this is Brandon Helwig, a publisher of UCSSports.com, and I'm honored today to be joined by Keenan Cummings, a writer for WVSports.com, part of the Rivals.com network, to preview this Saturday's game between the UCF Knights and West Virginia Mountaineers, which will kick off at 12 noon on FS1. Uh, welcome, Keenan. Thank you for having me. Uh, yeah. Uh, as we were talking a little bit before the show, you know, I've always kind of admired from afar. You run a great website, and we've interacted a little bit on the little recruiting bit. trail but now, now we're we're conference mates yeah that's uh, interesting I mean, it's been kind of you know for ucf they haven't had a lot of success so far in the big 12 but being for me it's been fun getting to know all these different schools and, and fan bases and sites and you know we were at oklahoma last week i know they're not going to be in the conference beyond this season but that was a lot of fun kansas state that was a, a fun trip uh manhattan was a great atmosphere kansas not quite as good as Kansas State, but it's been kind of fun to get to know these different fan bases. Well, Keenan, what's I guess generally just speaking, what's kind of your background with West Virginia? How long have you been covering the team? I, I take it you've kind of been here for this entire Big 12 experience for, for, for West Virginia, correct? Yeah, I actually attended school at West Virginia. I grew up in the state. Um, a lot of people on the beat do that here. Uh, grew up in the state. You know, I, I was student writer. I've covered West Virginia pretty much. For as long as I can remember in an official capacity, I think I began uh, 2010, 2011, but actually kind of made a name for myself covering recruiting before I was ever paid for it. You know, it used to be fun. Yeah. You know, recruiting <laughs> used to be fun when it was a hobby, but it becomes yeah. a job. It's not as it's not as fun. But, uh, I, you know, I've kind of worked my way over the years. You know, I, I tell people this all the time. You know, when I first got on the beat, you know, everybody's the new guy when they first get on the beat. Now I look around that room. There's maybe three or four guys that were there before I was. So I'm, I'm, I've quickly become an old guy. So, so did you grow up in, in, in the state of West Virginia? Yeah. Uh, I'm from hurricane, West Virginia. It, it's spelled like hurricane, but you'll know you're, you'll, you'll know you're from there. If you pronounce it. Correctly. Okay. Actually I've seen that. I never would have noticed not pronounced hurricane. Wasn't yes. there a good quarterback from there? Am I remembering? Uh, yeah. yeah. There's, there's been a few, uh, okay. Donnie Mays took over the program a few years ago and, uh, has really kind of turned them around. They're having a really good season this year. Uh, the old Redskins, but uh, yeah, I'm from Hurricane. It's it, to make it easy. If you have any sense of West Virginia geography, it's pretty much in between Charleston, which is the state's capital, and Huntington, okay. which is where Marshall's located. Yeah, and UCF played Marshall, you know, for years yes. and so, really in Conference USA. I assume some UCF fans will be familiar with that. Uh, that's where I'm from. Moved up to Morgantown for school and have stayed here ever since. Okay, you know it. Uh, so I've been around the program a yeah, long time. Yeah, yeah. Since we're talking about you know state of West Virginia, just what's what's kind of the 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 vibe or you know the people it just seems to me from the outside the west virginia mountaineers i mean it's huge you don't have a pro team obviously in the state of west virginia i know there's marshall university there too but it, 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 am i correct that you know, if you're from west virginia maybe if you don't even go to the school are they just how big how important are the mountaineers to the state of west virginia it wouldn't be an exaggeration to say it's everything. You know, I, I can speak to this because I'm very familiar. You have that little pocket in Huntington that roots for Marshall. And, of course, right. there's a few throughout the state. But most of the state, and I mean it's a no offense to Marshall, but most of the state is Mountaineer fans. And the thing about West Virginia is there's a lot of transplants. So people are wondering how West Virginia puts up good TV numbers all the time. You know, there's a lot of people that root for West Virginia that are from West Virginia that don't live in West Virginia. Yeah, right. they're, they're kind of transplanted throughout the country. You know, the play-by-play -play guy, Tony Caridi, has a saying, there's always a West Virginia connection. And, and if you look hard enough, there probably is. Yeah, and, and that's that's true. I mean, we're probably we're going to talk about this game in terms of, you know, how many West Virginia fans you think are coming down. But I've always noticed that just being in Florida, like, you know, there's West Virginia fans in Florida, and it, they don't necessarily have to attend the school, whether they're – from there, their parents were from there. They they moved down to Florida sometime a generation or two ago. They remain West Virginia fans, and I know that's something to me that's always been unique about West Virginia. Yeah, it's a diehard group. Um, they're frustrated right now. The fan base <laughs> has been frustrated for a few years, but you, it's hard to find a more passionate group uh, of fans, really, for such a small population. And West Virginia is a very small state, but fans all over. You know, there's a great turnout for that Houston game. Uh, there's alumni chapters, there's several in Florida that are big, you know, a lot of different places throughout the country. So it, it's got a lot of support and it would really it would very much surprise me if there's not quite a bit of fans in the stands. Yeah. Well, let's, let's kind of talk about this, this, I guess, first half of the season now uh, for West Virginia. I know coming into this year, 
you know, off season content. A lot of these places, they want to talk about coaches on the hot seat. And it seemed like, you know, Neil Brown's name was the one kind of at the top of the list. And people weren't expecting much from the Mountaineer football team this year. I, I know the last couple of games have not gone the way you wanted, but it, it feels like, you know, they kind of surprised some folks with that. Yeah, was it, uh, was it four and one or before yeah. he started dropping some games? So it was a pretty good start for West Virginia. How would you kind of characterize kind of looking at the off season and the expectations and kind of how the early part of the season went? Exactly how we all predicted it. <laughs> yeah. What the 14th, they took that personally. Um, I thought that this was a better team than uh, many people had kind of projected for them. You know, I, I, I've said this several times and I don't know if you feel the same, but it's hard enough to keep up with your own team anymore with all yeah. the turnover, all the transferring, everything that happens more or less trying to figure out what's going on at other schools. So I, I think a lot of that was looking at what West Virginia had returning and kind of making some guesses there. Uh, this is a team that for the most part through five weeks played great football. Um, they lost at Penn state. That's a tough game to yeah. open up. I don't think many people thought they'd win that game. They were in it though. In it yeah. in the third quarter had a chance to, I won't say win it, but at least make it even more competitive than it was. Could not capitalize on some plays. You know, then they go on a run. Uh, they beat Duquesne. They knock off Pitt, which is as important as any game on the schedule for West Virginia. You ask some fans if Pitt's on the schedule, they would take that one over. They'd go 1-11 and if they could beat Pitt. <laughs> but uh, they beat Pitt, and then they surprise. They beat Texas Tech at home, and then they go on the road and beat TCU, which really got some attention. Uh, that's before TCU's quarterback got hurt. So made some noise, and then lost on a Hail Mary at Houston. I saw uh, I, a lot of people saw that game. <laughs> yeah, that was a great game, but not the way it ended for you guys. I've seen teams lose on Hail Marys. I'm not sure I've ever seen a team score a 50 yard touchdown with 12 seconds left and then lose on a Hail Mary. So it crazy sequence there. And then last week we're, we're beating Oklahoma state in the fourth quarter uh, with about 14 minutes left. Had just gotten off the field. We're getting the ball back An egregious turnover. The, the, the blocker ran into the returner. Uh, fumbled a punt, Oklahoma State yeah. got it, cashed in, and then West Virginia kind of just imploded. They allowed 28 points in, in the fourth quarter, allowed 20 points through the first three, and 10 of those were directly off turnovers. So just imploded. So now West Virginia finds themselves at four and three. Uh, the record isn't necessarily surprising how they've gotten here, definitely. You know, you had all that momentum, you're four and one, you're feeling good about yourself. You know, some people were starting to – there's a saying here, trust the climb. That's Neil Brown's saying. Uh, people were starting to trust it a little bit more, uh, starting to get back on board. And then the last two weeks happened, and now the Malcontent has set in again. I think this is a huge game for West Virginia and UCF for that reason. I mean, both these teams need a win. And I think it's going to be interesting to see how West Virginia comes out in this game. You know, is this going to be a team that's hungry? Are they going to try to put behind what happened the last two weeks? Or is that that – oh, here we go again type situation that's really kind of defined Neil Brown's tenure here. Yeah, I mean, since you kind of you know talked about trust the climb and maybe they're not trusting it as much after the last two games, but Neil Brown, you know, we talked about, you know, maybe people thought he was on the hot seat. Where would you kind of say he is now? Uh, is, is that hot seat getting a little bit warmer after the last two? Is this, I know you say it's an important game, you know, UCF people are like, this is a must win just because UCF has not gotten a big 12 win. They kind of blew a big opportunity against Baylor at home uh, a month ago, which was the last home game. And this is kind of viewed as a game that if it's a home game for UCF, they not to say they will win it, but it's a game that you would hope that they could win. How would you characterize this game just relative to Neil Brown's hot seat? Is this kind of a sort of a must win game, especially when you're looking at an 0 and 4 UCF in the big 12? I think last week, might have been more damaging just the way it unfolded because it's just it's not it's not one player it's not one sequence but it almost feels like they're snake bitten you know they just some yeah. of the things that if, if you played a bingo card i think this team in neil brown's five years has lost in just about every possible way you can lose and it just some of it's just crazy you know if an all-american center makes a bad snap maybe the worst one he's ever had in his career when they're going in to beat oklahoma two years ago you know, Hail Mary, you know, just completely collapsing on defense when your defense has played great pretty much all season. But, yeah, this is the, – the seat is getting warmer, <laughs> uh, at least from a fan base. When I, right. Now, when I say this, obviously, I'm just talking from the fan base. Right. The administration's a different thing. But 
I've never seen such a sharp turn. You know, if you go on our message board, there was optimism. People were talking about going, being eight and one, going to Oklahoma, really maybe being a dark horse. And now it's right back to, man, is this team going to win another game? You know, this same old stuff. You know, fans are down right now, and rightfully so. You know, when you lose football games, a lot of it's self-inflicted. You know, that's what this team didn't do through the first five weeks. They didn't beat themselves. They've done the exact opposite the past two weeks. I mean, they've done everything in their power to beat themselves. So, yeah, this is a very important game. You lose this one, you fall to four and four after four and one start. And, yes, the Big 12 is very competitive this year. But you take, you know, teams three through 14, shake them up in a hat. It's not as talented of a league overall from top to bottom as it's been. You know, there's not a lot of those. You know, Oklahoma State is now figuring it out, but they weren't Oklahoma State. Baylor isn't the Baylor. Kansas State isn't necessarily the Kansas State of the past few years. So the opportunity was there, and fans can't help but feel you might have squandered this opportunity. So this is a great chance for West Virginia to go on the road and build some confidence. They did it at TCU. They went on the road and won a game that not many people, I think there were 14-point dogs in that game. And really, had they just been able to take care of some things, they would have won that game by more than one score. So. We'll see how it goes. I think it's a critical game just to see how this team responds because, as I mentioned earlier, there's that kind of feeling, you know, from people that watch this team that, oh, here we go again. And if you fall yeah. in that trap, it, it's almost hard to believe that a team that's four and one could go from four and one to four and four so quickly. But it's definitely within the realm of possibility. Yeah, right? I mean, it's a manageable schedule in the the back half of it. You know, UCF, you know, BYU, you have it in Morgantown. You don't have to go all the way to Provo. Oklahoma is the only game. I guess that's the week after that is going to be tough. You got to go to Norman, but then you close it out with Cincinnati and Baylor. I mean, those are all winnable games for West Virginia. So, so what's, what's kind of the the upside or what's kind of the positive view? What, what would be, you know, the best finish for West Virginia at this point? Would that be, you know, winning out maybe the exception of o- Oklahoma? Is that kind of the best case scenario in your eyes? Yeah, I think fans would love to see eight and four, you know, just, just because, you know, I mean, West Virginia has been in this league over a decade now. They've seen a lot of football. They know kind of how it goes. You know, they, they saw the schedule. They saw how the teams were performing. You know, this is the year to get it done. Uh, you know, for for his, all the things that Neil's done off the field and for as good as a guy he is, he's be the first person to tell you it comes down to winning. And he's not won enough as the head coach at West Virginia. There's expectations here. This is a proud program. And I'm not saying anything that he hasn't said. You know, he's 26 and 28, I believe, in five years. I don't think anyone associated with West Virginia would have thought that uh, when they hired him for the job. And it was a slam dunk. You know, everyone knew the first year or two was going to be kind of rebuilding because Dana really did leave the cupboard pretty bare. Yeah. Uh, there wasn't a lot of a lot of talent there. He had to build up the lines, and and he's done that. But, again, you're seeing some of these same mistakes you saw in year one, year two, year three. And once you lose fans, it's really hard to get them back. And some of them are lost, but some of them are still teetering. Yeah, you know, They go on a losing streak here, and uh, it's probably going to get a little messy. Speaking of Dana, since you brought him up, uh, we, we talked about that, that Hail Mary and losing that Houston game for the fan base. How much more did that hurt? Not just because you lost on a Hail Mary, but it was Dana's team that did it. To a degree. I think most people. I think kind of gotten over it. Is yeah, I think, well, I think most people wanted Dana gone. And, anyway, you know, Dana, 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 they were happy when he kind of left. Yes, the Dana, Dana left for the Houston job, but I'm not sure he was long for Morgantown. Anyways, okay. so. Okay. Yes, I do think there's there for some it stinks. You know, they you don't want to lose to Dana. You don't want to lose the guy that you replaced right. thinking you had a better coach. I mean, obviously, watching the way those final mo- moments unfolded, you know, with West Virginia going ahead, as a West Virginia, if you've if you've been around the program, you watch Dana's tenure here, you're thinking, Man, I've seen this movie before. I know how it ends. You know, Dana yeah. blew a game, he scored a bunch of points and blew a game at the end. But yeah, he 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 figured it out and won in that instance. But really yeah. You know, West Virginia had a pretty offense, scored a lot of points. You know, Dana's had more success than Neil so far. There's no questioning that. But fans kind of got sick of the 48 to 45 wins. You know, yeah, yeah, it's exciting, but what's an exciting loss? Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about West Virginia quarterback Garrett Green. Uh, <laughs> that went, that Houston game, now that we're talking about it, right? He had a celebration penalty, am I right? 
Yeah. When West Virginia went up and that made it a little bit easier for Houston with field position to kind of be in position to throw that Hail Mary. But just, just tell me a little bit about Garrett. He's, he's a Florida native originally from Tallahassee. He's been at West Virginia a few years now. I know we kind of entered the starting lineup last season, correct? After JT Daniels kind of fizzled out or just kind of tell me a little bit, I guess, about Garrett and then kind of what kind of quarterback he, he's been for the Mountaineers. Neil recruited him at Troy. He was one of the first offers that West Virginia sent out when he when he came. Okay, to okay. Down. So he's a guy that West Virginia is familiar with. You know, he's a dual threat guy, developed as a passer. He's better now, way better now than he was before, more confident in the scheme. He's a very excellent runner. You know, if he gets out, he can make some things happen. He injured his ankle over two games, missed two games earlier this year, uh, Pitt and Texas Tech, and the offense struggled for that. He has been the engine on the offense. Uh, he, this offense has gone pretty much how he's gone. Uh, and really, they've opened it up. They've been throwing the ball much better the last couple of weeks. So he threw for 391 against Houston. That's the most that any quarterback has thrown since Neil has been here. Uh, had a pretty good performance last week. Had one or two throws he'd like back. I think you have that pretty much every game with him. But you take the good with the bad. Um, yeah, he's excited to get back home. You know, he should have a lot of people at the game. And uh, – it's really kind of amazing how how much he's developed. You know, at times, like when they put him in in the past, he would be pretty much just he's going to run the ball. Uh, he's become much more of a dual threat, and his skill set is still developing. So the ceiling there uh, could still go a little higher, you know, as he continues to get more comfortable and do, do what he has to do. Yeah, and uh, he's he's a team's second leading rusher with 349 net yards, which isn't that far off from the leading rusher, C.J. Donaldson. Tell me a little bit about C.J., because I know – West Virginia is going to come in running the ball, whether it's the running back or the quarterback. What kind of running back uh, has C.J. Donaldson been? Uh, he struggled a little bit this year. You know, he's a bigger back. He's actually a former tight end. Okay. Had never played running back before. Last year broke out on the scene. Uh, they moved him there. He performed really well. This year he seems to be a little hesitant at times, and it's hurt him. You know, that uh, Chad Scott, the offensive coordinator, who also coaches running back, said this week, you know, we got to get him to stop thinking. You know, just run, play free run, play free, because at times he, he does seem to be a little bit more hesitant. Uh, last week they put Justin Johnson in there. He's missed a lot of this season with injury and illness, and it looked different. He was more decisive, got downhill faster, and I think that kind of stuff will motivate CJ. You know, I think that he's still a guy that they're going to need. You know, they need him to play well. You know, when he doesn't run the ball well, they tend to struggle offensively, you know, especially in those games that Garrett Green didn't play. You know, you mentioned Garrett Green's rushing numbers. He didn't play two games. Yeah, due to an ankle injury. So okay. that kind of shows you his impact that, that he's had. But they need CJ to play well. And and they need they what West Virginia really needs out of the backfield, they have not been able to break tackles or big runs. You know, it's they've really struggled with it. Last week they had a couple runs that were blocked up, should have got 30, 40 yards, and they got nine, 10, 14, you know, just not make not breaking tackles at the second level. And it's something they have the ability to do. They've done it in the past. But for whatever reason, uh, it, for running backs and wide receivers this year, breaking tackles has not been a strength. And West Virginia leads the conference in time of possession, at least in conference games, averaging over 34 minutes. And UCF, on the opposite end, is last in the Big 12 in time of possession, averaging just a little bit over 26 minutes. Is, is that is that a methodical style of offense? Is, is that an emphasis? Uh, are we going to see West Virginia run the ball a lot? And are they going to take as much time off the, off the clock as, as as possible? Is that kind of the Neil Brown MO? Yeah, I think you'll see them run the ball. I mean, obviously, they want to be more explosive. Yeah, you know, They'll take downfield shots. But like I said, a lot of it has come down to they'll get enough for a first down, but they're not breaking those runs. And okay. if they want to be more explosive offense, they've got to figure out a way to do that. Uh, it's hard in college football to consistently sustain, you know, 10, 12 play drives. I mean, it's just you're going to have a you're going to have a tackle for loss. You're going to have an incompletion. You're going to have a penalty. And when West Virginia gets knocked off schedule, it's been tough for them this year. And I think that's what they've got to overcome, especially with a team like UCF that's going to be able to score points. You know, West Virginia's defense, it's been high and it's been low, and right now it's on the low side. They need a bounce back performance, and it's not necessarily a great recipe to play an explosive offense like UCF when you need to find figure out yourself on defense. Yeah. I on the offensive side for for West Virginia, who are some of the other players to watch? Maybe at receiver, tight end, uh, offensive line, who are some of the other uh, standout players for the Mountaineers? The offensive line is great. You know, it, it's the strength of this team um overall. You know, Zach Frazier is an all-American type player at center. 
Wyatt Milam is on his way to a pro career at left tackle. Doug Nestor at right tackle. You know, they have, a, they have, uh, I think it was 133 career starts coming into the season uh, for their offensive line. Uh, tight end Cole Taylor has been pretty good this year. They'll use him in the passing game. Uh, didn't play his best against Oklahoma State, but I think that was more of an anomaly. He just had kind of a down game. They've got a bunch of different receivers. They've struggled to find consistency there. Devin Carter is probably the number one guy transferred from NC State. Uh, he's kind of found his footing the last couple weeks, had, had a touchdown last week. And they've got some other guys, too. A.J. Horton is another transfer from Marshall uh, that has played really well. He runs at a different speed. And they mix in a lot of guys uh, at wide receiver, but they need to find some, some consistency. That's really been the biggest issue offensively. This offensive line has been consistent as can be. Everybody else kind of up and down. Yeah. Now we look to the other side of the ball, defense, and then you kind of talked about that, about them a minute ago. Uh, just kind of sum up what you've seen from that side of the ball. Uh, are there some players to watch? Is it an improving unit? Uh, just kind of tell me about the state of West Virginia's defense, I guess, entering this game. It's hard to figure out. I mean, they played as well as West Virginia's played defensively probably since 2020 through that three-game stretch. Uh, now Pitt struggles offensively, so that helped yeah. a little bit. But Texas Tech and TCU have good offenses, you know, especially when they were healthy. And West Virginia really made them struggle. Uh, they had a TCU hit them for a couple big plays, but other than that, they they put the clamps down in the second half. They could not really do anything. And for whatever reason, coming out of the bye week, West Virginia struggled, and some of it's just basic stuff, you know, driving through and on tackles, ma making tackles. I think they missed sixteen or eighteen tackles against Oklahoma State. Now, some of that is Ollie Gordon. That yeah. guy is impressive. I, I've seen a lot of running backs already this year, including both the Penn States, and I think Ollie Gordon is by far the best running back I've seen. Uh, really good player. But, you know, a lot of it's them, you know, losing leverage, you know, not fitting the run right, stuff that they just have not done. They, they completely exploded on him in the fourth quarter against Oklahoma State. So this week they kind of are going back to the basics, and they've done this before under Neal. If they've struggled and it's worked, you know, they've come out of these situations and they've looked a lot better. They're going to have to look better. You know, you fit yeah. the run wrong against against uh, UCF with what they do with motions and how they try to run the football. It's going to be a big play. So you need to get that figured out and figured out in a hurry. Uh, we've seen this defense be great. Uh, so it's there. The potential is there. Whether or not you're going to get that unit or the unit you saw in the fourth quarter last week, that's anybody's guess. Yeah. Yeah. You could almost say what you said and apply it to UCF after that Kansas game a couple of weeks ago. It was a terrible defensive performance. Uh, the defense was already struggling in Big 12 play, but during the bye week, they went, you know, back to the basics, you know, ones versus ones, tackling drills. And, you know, I don't know, this day and age, like, you know, they try to limit hitting in the preseason. They want to keep everyone healthy. And sometimes, you know, it's it's tough to replicate that. And then once you get to the games, you better be on point or you're going to struggle. But, but yeah, who, are, who are some of the top defensive players? Are there's there a player or two to watch on that side of the ball that are uh, standout players for West Virginia? Yeah, the defensive line as a whole, you know, they rotate a lot of guys. Sean Martin, Eddie Vesterinen, uh, Mike Lockhart, you know, they, they'll play six, seven, eight guys there, and they've played well for the most part. The only game they have not played well was Houston, and that was pretty much just a letdown by the entire defense for that game. But I think that that unit's played well. Lee Koba is their, is their linebacker that really stands out. Now, they've had some injuries too, which mm -hmm. I'd be remiss not to mention that. You know, I know injuries are part of the game, but they've right. lost some key players, especially at linebacker and safety where they could not afford to lose them. So they've been working kind of with a patchwork unit a little bit. But as defensive coordinator Jordan Leslie says, you can't make excuses. Everybody's got to deal with stuff like that. You know, it, it's part of playing football, especially in a Power 5 conference. Well, Power 4 now, I guess. But uh, especially playing in a, in a league like this where the margin for error is just so slim. So Aubrey Burks is back. He got he a scary situation against Houston, uh, which really affected them in the second half. But he had to be carted off uh, with a neck injury. He's back now, uh, kind of got his feet wet a little bit against Oklahoma State, played pretty well for the most part, and that changes their secondary. They're much better with him in there, so I think that's going to help them. But a lot of questions. You know, it's yeah. one thing that you, you could have came into this, if you would have asked me two weeks ago, the only thing I would have been sure of is the defense. Yeah. But now uh, we'll, we'll have to wait and see because I think this is going to be a challenge. These are two teams that desperately need a win. 
uh, to really change the trajectory of their season. So I think both these teams are going to get each other's best shot. Yeah. Recruiting wise for West Virginia. I mean, I've always known they've recruited Florida as long as I've been, you know, following this stuff. And, you know, a lot of the best West Virginia players I know came from Florida. Is that still as big as an emphasis as it always has been, or has the big 12 changed recruiting territories? Do you recruit maybe Texas and that area, maybe more than you did. What's kind of the, the recruiting, you know, territory for, for West Virginia, where, where do you see the most players come from? When Dana first got here, he tried the little foray into Texas and it didn't work out. It's just, it's harder to sell those guys. Yes. You can get some of the guys that slip through the cracks, right? But it's harder to sell those guys. Hey, yeah, you can come play in the Big 12 when there's 12 other schools. I'm exaggerating a little bit. Yeah, but that right are at home. Yeah, I mean, why would you want to go all the way out there? But, yeah, they, they're they recruiting their same traditional areas. They recruit Florida well, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Maryland, you know, states like that. And they've gotten a lot of talented players over the years from those areas. I think Neil's put a big focus with the transfer portal, especially now because, you know, guys get malcontent. They leave before they even get started, trying to get those guys closer to home. Because if you get those guys closer to home, yeah. they're more likely to stay. Uh, they're they're less likely to say, "Hey, you know, I'm 15 hours from my home. I, I'm on pieces. I'm done, deuces." So I think that they yeah. put an emphasis on that and really made it a priority to kind of get guys. Now they're still recruiting Florida. They're still landing guys in Florida. Uh, obviously, it's harder now than it used to be. Uh, not only with the the schools that are down there, but UCF being in the same conference. You know, it's it's kind of like Cincinnati and Ohio. If you're selling the same thing uh, to to kids, unless they just really want to get, get yeah. away from home, most of them are usually going to take the option closer to home. Yeah, and C.J. Donaldson, the running back, he's from Florida. I know I mentioned the quarterback being from Florida, but both the quarterback and running back are from are from Florida. Uh, transfer portal wise, I see you just you said Neil's he's he's expanding that. I mean, is he really big in the portal? Do do you guys try to be like half and half high school and, and portal recruiting, or do you lean more on portal lately, or is it just kind of like maybe depends on where the biggest needs are year to year? He started here. It was all about developmental. He kept saying this is a developmental program, developmental program, and it was pretty much predominantly high school kids, but it's shifted. They're, they're taking more transfers. I think you have to in today's college yeah. football. If you're not, you're going to get left behind. Look at what's happened at Clemson, uh, for example. You know, Dabo has been against that, and it, it's hurt them. Uh, you have to. You've got to adjust. You, you, you adjust or you get left behind. And West Virginia's done a better job. They struck out really poorly in the portal last year with a lot of different guys. Uh, you, you can name – you know, go down the list of the guys they, they took and – not many of them worked out for what they expected. This year's been different. Yeah. You know, most of the guys have, but the, it's it's going to be an area, regardless of who the coach is, that they've got to do well on. That where West Virginia was really hurt the first couple years, their NIL collective wasn't really set up here, and they got poached. You know, Miami, Georgia, you know, you name it. Schools came in and took some of West Virginia's best players, and that's something that kind of piled on too with Neil. You know. Just another thing yeah. that's happened during his tenure. They've adjusted now, but you you think about how good this team might have been had you been able to keep guys around like Tyke Smith, who's what he's doing at Georgia, you know, Akeem Mesidor at Miami, you know, you go down the list. A bunch yeah. of guys that really could have made a, a significant difference that opted to go elsewhere. Yeah, we, we were just talking about West Virginia recruiting Florida and transfer portal. Conversely, it's interesting UCF has a starting offensive lineman transfer who was originally from Morgantown, West Virginia, Marcellus Marshall. He played at Kent State the last couple of years, and he trans. I, I I don't get the sense West Virginia really recruited him though, um, or, or offered him. And you know, I'm sure they didn't offer him if he went to Kent State. But did, did you know much about that recruitment last year? He's a Morgantown kid. I mean, you would think that you know maybe that'd be a natural for West Virginia to to recruit. Um, yeah, I, I don't think West Virginia pursued all that heavily there. I remember him his first go around. You know, I watched him in camp yeah. here when he was out of high school. You know, big kid, developmental kid. You know, obviously he's he's in, he's grown. You know, since he's been at Kent State, or uh, you know, developed into the player he is today. So I think it's interesting though, like the connections. Yeah. You know, like I said, there's always a West Virginia connection. Yeah. Always, always. So what's kind of the West Virginia view on, I guess, this evolving Big 12, uh, you know, for the first, you know, dozen or so years, you know, you've been on this island, you know, kind of by yourself. And I know when I ever looked at your message board at various times, I know there's 
a longing to maybe be in a more regionally based conference, such as the ACC and, you know, playing Pittsburgh annually, Virginia Tech and those schools. Uh, but it is what it is. You had to take the best opportunity. I'm sure, there, you know, there's people who look at Louisville and see, well, you know, that should have been our spot in the ACC. It just kind of worked out the way it did. Um, West Virginia getting the first opportunity to go to the Big 12. But what's what's kind of been, I guess, the West Virginia view of the Big 12 this last, last decade or so? And, and how do they view things now with, there's at least a few more Eastern time zone teams now with Cincinnati and UCF. I mean, Cincinnati's a little bit more geographically, you know, close to Morgantown. And now we've got Arizona schools, you know, Utah and, and Colorado. What's kind of the West Virginia view on this new Big 12? I think fit wise, if you go to these schools, you know, you go out, yeah, you, you've been to a few of them now. You, you meet yeah. the people there. They're so much like West Virginia. West Virginia was never a fit culturally in the big east you know there's so many i mean a few schools yes but yeah most of them did not fit what west virginia is you know these a lot of these schools are land grant schools you know the people are very similar you, know, you go out to oklahoma it's, it's almost like west virginia you know, without yeah. the mountains uh, yeah. so that what from that perfect you know the fan bases west virginia's reinvented their reputation you know a lot there would have been a lot of horror stories about Morgantown and some of it, you know, there are rowdy fans. Here. Yeah, I remember there's and there's something where you can leave at halftime and go to your car and drink and you can come back in. Was that that, that used to be a thing with West Virginia? It's not anymore. Okay. But uh, <laughs> and there was horror right. stories uh, yeah. about Morgantown by some of these fan bases that quite truthfully they're rivals. You know, West yeah. Virginia fans just don't necessarily complain as much as some of these other fan bases, but they have the same stories if you really want to dig in. But they had a chance to reinvent themselves and you ask pretty much any visiting fan base from the big 12 that's been to Morgantown and they'll tell you how great it is, how accommodating it is. And that's the same thing for West Virginia, you know, but the downside of that is you're not going to interact with Kansas fans daily. You know, you're not going to interact with Oklahoma state fans or UCF fans or really even Cincinnati. It's about five hours away. Yeah. You interact with Pitt fans, you interact with Virginia tech fans, you know, you, th that is your bread and butter. And no matter what happens, West Virginia will always – there's just not a game on the schedule anymore unless it's non-conference that moves the needle for this fan base. I mean, if you watched that pit game, I don't know if you did, take a look at the crowd. It was yeah. sold out. The atmosphere was electric. Yeah, I said I've covered this team for over a decade, been involved with it longer than that. That's one of the best crowds I've seen. Just fans wanting that game back on the schedule. Yeah. So you're always going to have that – that that missing element that makes college football fun and really it's kind of the the downside the the sadness of realignment but i think if you ask west virginia fans if you could let's just say peak five ten years down the road if the big 12 could absorb virginia tech Pitt, you know louisville and nc state or syracuse yeah. take a pick they would love this league it would be it would be perfect in every sense every every yeah. way that you could imagine yeah, I mean, we wait to see, you know, future Big 12 scheduling models. I think they say late November, early December for figuring that out. I mean, I guess if you ask UCF fans, just, you know, you see, we've got no relationship or, or history with any of these Big 12 schools, I guess, other than Cincinnati. It's kind of a semi rivalry the last few years. The UCF fans would like to at least keep some regular Eastern teams on the schedule, Cincinnati and West Virginia. I mean, did West Virginia fans like, do they, would they want to play UCF annually every year or just, it would make, make no difference either way. I don't think anybody's going to turn down a trip to Orlando in you know, late October or, you know, November. I mean, trips to Florida are nice. So, but in terms of just, you know, I, I would be lying to you if I said West Virginia fans are going, Oh yeah. <laughs> UCF. That's that's the team. We got to yeah, that's our new rival. And even even to a degree yeah. Cincinnati, you know, yeah. they have a history, but it's not they were never rivals. You know, they've played a few times. You hope that forms over time. But it's not rivalries don't form by saying, "Hey, you're close. I'm close." Right. Let's play if you are not really that just we're, we're close just just because it's the big 12. I mean, do you have nothing in common really with schools in Texas and Oklahoma yeah, and yeah, Kansas? I mean, and now it's like, well, you're Eastern time zone. So now you're rivals. So that's like Cincinnati yeah. and Louisville I always describe as very similar with West Virginia. But there was yeah. there was a period there in the big East where they played some high state games and it kind of stuck with the fan base in both sports. So I wouldn't even call them a rival, but more of a rival than Cincinnati, I would say, to most of the fan yeah. base. But it's just. The hierarchy is like Pitt and then Virginia Tech right under them. And then 
Yeah. You got Syracuse, Maryland, and then pretty much everybody else. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know if you have a sense or, or, or know, you know, what, what kind of West Virginia traveling contingent we're going to see in Orlando. I, I've heard, you know, I think they sold out their allotment. I'm sure other fans, you know, secondary market. I think there's going to be, and just not just people traveling. I, like we talked earlier, there's a ton of West Virginia people in, in the state of Florida. So I'm sure it's going to probably be the, the, the biggest visiting crowd UCF has seen in a long time. I know when, when West Virginia played South Florida, when both teams were in the Big East back in the day, I think if you look at South Florida attendance records, a lot of those were games against West Virginia. And I feel that was, those numbers were aided by Mountaineer fans helping to fill Raymond James Stadium. So I don't know, have you seen chatter on your message board or just through the grapevine about, you know, what kind of, you know, what kind of traveling contingent we're going to see on Saturday? There will be fans there. There will be quite a bit of West Virginia fans. Now, I don't know how much the recent performance <laughs> has affected some of those plans because, I mean, as I said, they're they're a big contingent. To frustrated, um, they yeah. they were frustrated under Dana. Yeah, they've been even more frustrated the last five years. And this is a proud program, you know. Yeah, they're fifteenth all time in wins in college football. You know, a lot of people don't realize that, but they are. I mean, they've won a lot of games. They've won a lot of big games. They've just kind of been stuck in this rut for the last better part of a decade. They've had a, a couple good years here and there, but not to the standard that this fan base is kind of used to competing for. So the frustration is mounting. Um, it's not affected attendance for the most part, but it, it you are starting to see a little bit of that trickle. Even last week, you know, it was homecoming. Now weather played a role, but there was only yeah. 51, 52,000. And that's not like West Virginia. Yeah. Last thing, you know, for, for West Virginia to win this game, what needs to happen? Uh, you know, if, as a media person, someone who's very familiar with the team, you know, if certain things go right, what needs to happen for West Virginia to be successful on Saturday? They need to be able to run the football, uh, kind of do what they've done. They cannot beat themselves. This team has to play more like the team that went four and one. You don't even have to be opportunistic necessarily. You just cannot give the game to your opponent. And that's quite literally what they've done the past two weeks. Um, just found ways to lose football games. And it's very reminiscent, as I mentioned earlier, about kind of what's unfolded, you know, during this tenure. So they got to find a way to do that. And they've got to get back to the basics on defense. It's cliche, it's coach speak, but you've got to play better fundamental defense because it's just, it's basic stuff. You know, guys yeah. not fitting the run right, you know, le losing leverage, you know, not tackling right not even being in position to tackle, just running by guys. And it's not things that's really been the identity of this defense through the first five weeks of the season. So if you can do those two things, you know, to keep, you got to keep UCF's offense in check and then you got to be able to run the football, which I know UCF struggled, you know, against the run uh, other than last, you know, they played really yeah. well against Oklahoma, but you got to find ways to, to put points on the board and quit playing one possession games because, West Virginia loves to play this roulette with one possession games where you're going to win almost as many as you're going to lose in those type of situations. You know, I've had a blast uh, talking to you, Keenan, and getting to know you and, and learning more about West Virginia. I appreciate you joining me. Thanks for having me on, man. Take care.